Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Dan Zielinski and along with co-organizing this symposium, I am a principal engineer and scientist with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and lead on the Fish Pass project in Traverse City, Michigan. The details of Fish Pass and some of the associated research in this symposium is the result of nearly seven years of planning, design, and implementation, which included contributions from well over 100 biologists and engineers. But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge our project partners and primary funders shown here. Today, I'll start by introducing the connectivity conundrum facing decisions on barriers in fragmented watersheds here in the Great Lakes and around the world. Then I'll discuss how this is playing out on the Boardman Ottawa River in Michigan and how an innovative project, Fish Pass, seeks to solve these ongoing issues by developing tools to selectively pass desirable fish species while blocking and or removing undesirable and often invasive. Connectivity within rivers and between rivers and their receiving waters is critical for many life history traits of fish and general watershed health. Barriers in the form of dams and or road crossings block connectivity in a system. This is a global issue as nearly 60% of all rivers contain at least one large dam. And it's dealing with these consequences of barriers that leads to the connectivity conundrum, where we try to manage the alternate management strategies of barrier removal for increased connectivity and barriers for invasive species control. In the Great Lakes alone, a network of nearly 250,000 barriers on tributaries affect the movement of an estimated 121 fishes known to show migratory movements. This includes blocking movements of invasive and otherwise undesirable species. There are numerous invasive species on the, in the Great Lakes, but arguably none have had a more devastating impact on the fishery than sea lamprey, an invasive species named the Atlantic Ocean. Sea lamprey gained access to the Great Lakes in the early 19th century, and due to their devastating feeding habits, contributed to the collapse of lake trout and lake whitefish populations. The Great Lakes Fishery Commission was formed in response to this fishery collapse. One of the major roles of the GLC is to manage and coordinate a sea lamprey control program that targets sea lamprey early life stages and reproduction. So sea lamprey parasitize fish out in the Great Lakes, but they move into tributaries to spawn where their larvae can stay for three or more years before they return back to the river to feed or the lake to feed. The control program relies on two primary uh, tools. The first is lamprecides, which are mostly species specific chemicals that are used to kill sea lamprey larvae in the tributaries. The other tool is barriers, which are used to block sea lamprey from accessing that spawning habitat in tributaries, thus reducing the amount of lamprecides needed for treatment. However, the same characteristics of these barriers that block sea lamprey also block most of our native fish from reaching that same spawning habitat. And while removal of such barriers is a recognizable solution, Restoring full connectivity can have both desirable and undesirable consequences, hence the connectivity conundrum. This is especially true, as I said before, at sites where barriers block invasive species. We propose to address this conundrum through selective connectivity. Now, the challenge of selective fish passage is fundamentally one of sorting an assortment of things. But sorting systems for live organisms without manual intervention don't really exist. And for this reason, we turn to other sectors for our inspiration. Now the framework for approaching technology selection and configuration that we plan to employ is actually inspired by the material recycling industry. Now this may seem like an odd analogy, but if you think carefully, both sectors present similar challenges. You essentially collect a mixture of items or fish and you wanna sort them so that you can pull out those that are desirable from those that are undesirable. Now, the processes and innovations developed in the material recycling industry provides useful guidance and lessons learned for the development and implementation of selective fish passage. And some of those, the main takeaways is that the, it's the emphasize, emphasis on automation and attribute driven sorting. So eliminating the need for manual intervention or manual sorting. Um, and focusing on attributes of the materials or the fish rather than trying to just collect one fish regardless of, of their attributes. Um, in the material recycling industry, that's using magnets, uh, sorting things based on their reflection, using x-rays, their size, density, shape, uh, color, all these types of things are used to be able to pull out eventually at the end a cohesive group of desirable material from undesirable. Now, but of course, porting these recycling processes and innovations to selective fish passage really requires an approach where we understand both the ecology and biology of the targeted fish and its ecosystem and integrate that with engineering designs from the onset. 
Now, when we start talking about attribute-based sorting for fish, we actually have a large uh, network or uh, possibility of configurations of different tools. And these have really been developed to focus on specific attributes of fish. Uh, and those include phenology, so the run timing. Fish are known to have different times that they move into systems, move at different times of day. Um, and this is already uh, exploited through the use of seasonal barriers. Um, however, because there's a lot of overlap in migration timing, it's not a universal solution. So then we look to things like morphology, which sort based on size or shape or color. So you can envision image recognition or screens or traps. Uh, and then we have behavior, which is kind of the most distinct feature or attribute for a living animal because they have volition. They can respond to their environment in predictable ways, essentially to self-sort. So that means uh, manipulating environmental conditions like sa with sound, light, bubbles, um, turbulence, velocity conditions, or using naturally occurring chemicals that might be used to attract or deter uh, species within the water. And then finally, we have physiology, which is kind of the, their uh, ability to overcome a significant challenge. That'd be whether they can jump over a barrier, swim a certain speed against a, a strong velocity, or even the possibility of attaching to a surface or swimming up a uh, studded tile ramp, as shown in the lower right-hand corner. Now, most of these technologies have all been tested at small scales, independently, and on single species. It's really the integration of these technologies at fish pass, which is expected to yield the biggest improvements to selective fish passage. And uh, in another talk, I definitely recommend you listen to, uh, Dr. Benoit will be talking about a guild analysis for Great Lakes migratory fish that he's developed, uh, where we plan to, to use that to objectively differentiate or group fish based on these sortable attributes. So that brings us back to fish pass, where our mission is really to provide up and downstream passage of desirable fishes while simultaneously blocking and or removing undesirable fishes. Our specific project objectives include essentially developing and testing uh, tools to be able to guide, sort, and pass fish, determine the protocols for implementing these solutions in the Boardman River and throughout the Great Lakes, and then be able to set all of that within the global context so that these approaches can be exported. So Fish Pass will be located on the Boardman Ottawa River in Traverse City, Michigan. It's about two hours north of Grand Rapids. The Boardman River has been the focus of a multi-year, multi-agency restoration project that removed three upstream dams and sought to modify the lowermost dam, Union Street Dam, for selective fish passage. The dam removals greatly improved the habitat and connectivity in the Boardman River, but it's left the system vulnerable to sea lamprey access. So if you think about it, instead of having four redundant barriers, you're now left with one that has a history of escapements. So that led the GLFC to be able to partner with numerous agencies and the local community to implement fish pass at the Union Street Dam. Now, the ultimate goal of this whole river restoration is to enhance connectivity between the Borden River and Lake Michigan, a goal that will only be possible through developments at fish pass, a project that will bring remarkable changes to the Union Street Dam and its surrounding space, as you see here. So essentially, Fish Pass will replace the Union Street Dam with an improved barrier with selective fish passage capabilities. Once constructed, we'll optimize various sorting technologies below that barrier. Uh, the site will be developed into a living laboratory aimed at fostering both academic research and community learning. And once an optimal configuration is identified for the Borden River fish community, the facility will be converted to a permanent selective fishway and we'll begin to export that process to other barriers. Now in this image, uh, it kind of highlights many of the main features of fish pass. And I don't have time to go over every little bulleted item, but I do want to uh, focus in on, on just a few. The first being the fish sorting channel. So this is the primary channel right in the middle of your screen. Uh, this is the primary site of research. It's a 400 foot long, 30 foot wide concrete flume. The, the sorting channel was designed for flexibility in mind and being able to accommodate different sorting methods and tools. And this is done by using uh, one of the hundreds of anchorage points that are located throughout and slots for installing and moving around those tools, as well as a gantry, movable gantry crane and data carriage to be able to uh, supplement that use. Uh, we also envision different routes for fish to encounter these tools, whether they swim in from the downstream end or move up the other channel and enter in through uh, a series of, of gates that connect them. Um, and then in addition to that, we can manipulate flows within the channel quite well 
by manipulating uh, a, one of a series of 13 head gates. We also have a removable partition where we can split the channel in two uh, or leave it as one large channel. And we also have tail lard control gates. Now on the other side of the channel is the nature-like bypass. This, along with the arc labyrinth right at the upstream end, are, are designed to be able to convey normal river flood and flood flows. It's designed with enhanced in-stream fish habitat in the form of riff run segments, engineered log jam, as well as just an additional 500 feet of vegetated riverbanks over the existing conditions. This bifurcated channel permits dual recreational and research use of the river, which is very important. And while I don't have time to expand on all the project components, it's easy to see that combined, they provide environmental, recreational, educational, and economic value to the community. So taking a step back now, so going back to that comparison with, with material recycling to fish passage, we can see here that the primary sequential stages of recycling really mirror the primary stages of fish passage, starting with collection. This is very similar to when fish approach the site. It's material or fish being brought in at different times and in different compositions. The second step, disintegration conditioning, is really, it, is very similar to entry. It's really the first opportunity where you can influence fish selecting one channel versus the other. It's that first step of, of sorting. Then you have your, your third stage, which is the primary site for, store, for sorting, where you can uh, put in recirculating systems, you know, cycle fish through multiple times or materials through multiple times to be able to get your, your uh, required kind of composition at the end. And then finally, fate. It's, you know, what's, hap what's happened after all of this process. And now I'm gonna step through those primary steps of selected fish passage at Fish Pass and briefly introduce some of the ongoing research supported by Fish Pass. So the first stage is the approach stage. Again, this is where fish move into the river at different times of year and day. Fish will essentially self-sort at this stage, somewhat, based on their species-specific movement phenologies. And we will use, uh, and we will be monitoring that movement through various telemetry technologies that will help us identify what fish use the river and when, and when they might be encountering things, as well as uh, at the same time monitoring the environmental conditions so we can start to build predictive models on when we'd expect fish to show up based on combination of discharge, temperature, or water stage. And as you can see here, this large group of fish that we've already been tracking in the Borden River, you see there's a lot of overlap in terms of when they're present within the Borden River. Um, this is also an opportunity where we could use kind of long range sorting tools such as pheromone because sea lamprey use pheromones to be able to identify where potential habitat might be for, for spawning. Um, and it's been shown to be able to, you can kind of pull fish into certain uh, river reaches. And this is an idea where we might want to bring sea lamprey into the Borgman River because we have a facility that can effectively trap and, and remove ideally. So next we move on to the entry stage. This is where fish detect and are guided towards the fish pass channels. Sorting at this stage can exploit the full range of attributes. One such approach could be utilizing turbulence plumes to attract fish towards one channel versus the other. Now we've had some previous research that found using a flow velocity enhancement system, which is essentially a Venturi tube pump, uh, to generate turbulence plume and it has been able to uh, attract sea lamprey in an open river channel. Now, in combination of this, we could also use a new technology called infrared uh, quantitative image velocimetry, which essentially uses infrared imagery to be able to quantify full fields, including those turbulence plumes, in near real time across the whole river to help inform observations of fish decisions at the entrance of those channels. Now, once fish enter the, the sorting channel, Fish can be guided, deterred, moved, or removed using a large suite of potential tools that, again, exploit the full range of attributes. For example, we could manipulate velocities within the channel to exploit differences in swimming capacity among fish. As you can see here, uh, this is a comparison of swimming performance curves for a number of uh, Great Lakes fish. On the left-hand side is the slower swimming fish, that includes sea lamprey, versus those that can reach higher end speed like uh, white sucker and walleye. Um, or we could also sort based on morphology using screens and traps. As I mentioned, screens are already a common tool for use at seasonal barriers and traps uh, in the sea lamprey control program, but morphology could also be used for image recognition, you know, and you can learn more that, about that in a later talk. And really our primary challenge at this stage 
will not be to test individual technologies, but really it's to evaluate numerous tools and configurations to optimize the solution for the Boardman River. And while I don't have time to go into all the detail of it, we do plan to use a Bayesian statistical method adopted from the material recycling industry to help us streamline that selection process. And later today, you can hear from several of the presenters that will summarize research on a range of tools for use here. Now I present kind of a hypothetical scenario where we can kind of step through the process of how we might sort fish. So like I mentioned before, one of the logical first steps might be size because it's easier to sort fish that are all of similar size versus really large sturgeon and really small perch. Um, we'd also use image recognition as a potential tool by sorting by shape or color. Then we have their swimming or leaping ability, we can sort them, or their responses to environmental cues like sound or light or their preferences for swimming at different depths in the water column. And then pairing all these tools with traps so that we can filter out both the desirable and non-desirable uh, fish for eventual passage or return to the lower river, river or removal. So finally, this leads us to the last stage where we ensure desirable fish exit in good condition and can finish their life cycle functions and possibly contribute to the fish communities upstream. Obviously, this will require a telemetry network similar to uh, assessing their uh, encounter rates, uh, where we wanna not only understand where fish are coming from, but where do they go once they're passed. Um, and along with that, we wanna understand the nutrients, energy, genes, and even contaminants that they're transporting with them, both from the Great Lakes into the river and from the river back out. And there will be a number of talks uh, in this symposium that will also provide a lot more detail on the study of energy nutrient dynamics, as well as assessment of possible consequences of different levels of connectivity. So I leave you with uh, a brief project timeline. Uh, as you can see, the project started in late 2014. We reached a final design in 2020. It went out for bid later that year. Uh, and just before construction was supposed to start, a legal challenge to the city uh, essentially put a pause on construction. Uh, we are hopeful that we will be able to start construction later this year, in which the construction process is, is expected to take about two years, and then we'll be able to start a, an approximately 10-year uh, optimization period at the facility. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining me today. Uh, feel free to contact me at my email shown here or see more details on FishPass at this website. And I also encourage you to listen to the other talks as part of the symposium. Thank you.